open our eyes. I want God to enlighten us. In fact, that's the title of the message. While I was there in, in Africa, uh, in the mornings, of course, I had some great opportunities to study the Word of God. And toward the end, the Lord began to speak to me about a passage of Scripture that I'm very fond of, which is Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. You know, a lot of people read this verse and they have a feeling that it is negative because of the words that precede it and follow it. Because it says it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the gift and become partakers of the Holy Spirit and the good word and the powers if they fall away to be renewed again to repentance. And that kind of scares people off of this verse because I believe they're misunderstanding what it says. I did not understand what this verse meant until 1995 when I had my encounter with the Lord on the road April 7th, 845 in the morning. I was enlightened. In fact, I was so enlightened I was blind for 45 minutes. I only saw a white light during that experience. But afterwards, this verse made perfect sense to me. And the reason it says it is because it's impossible for those who were once enlightened, once they've been enlightened, and then it says if they, if they follow it to be renewed again. It's not saying it because, you know, if you backslide, it's too late for you. It's saying that you will not fall away. Because once you've truly been enlightened, and you've experienced the things that are detailed in this verse, there's no going back. You're so secure in who He is, in the reality of His presence, that there's no doubts at all. Before 1995, I had a lot of doubts. I had different ideas. I thought, what if, what if I'm just imagining this? What if this is my emotions? How many of you have ever fought those ideas? Maybe this is just a pretentious thing that we're doing and did I really feel that and it's amazing that in the presence of the Lord you feel one way but when you go out and go home you feel a different way you'll have experiences in a church meeting that later you'll think about and wonder why did I act like that why did I feel that and experience that and I'm going to by taking this verse and dividing it up for you and talking about it, I'm going to explain why that happens. And more importantly, I'm going to encourage you to know that you can make sure that that does not happen again. While I was there, God uh, powerfully moved on uh, Sister Mary, who kept us in her home. By the last day, she said she woke up in the morning and the Holy Spirit was standing in her room. You could feel her standing. She said and she woke up. She felt the hair on her arms rise, her whole body. And I was so excited. And I said, Mary, that's Him. That's Him. That's the blessed Holy Spirit. He's come to take your hand and walk with you. It was an enlightenment. And she was so excited. There is, there is this realm for us. Uh, there are levels and realms of the Spirit that God is leading us into. For us to walk in the fullness of our spiritual inheritance here on earth as God's children, we must be enlightened. This enlightenment is the subject of this message. And so enlightened, I do want to mention that Jesus is the one who enlightens us. He is the origin of life. All things were made by him. In fact, light itself. Remember, he said, let there be light. Actually, it says in the Hebrew, he said, the Lord said, light. Doesn't say, he didn't really say, let there be light. That's just how we put it together to translate it or interpret it from, or almost transliterate it. It would be, and the Lord said, light. Because when he spoke it, it came into existence. All he has to do is say the word and it is reality. So he looked into darkness and said, Light! And existence came online. Time began. Everything around us. So Jesus is the one, because it says in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and all things were made by Him, right? The Word was God. All things created. Nothing was made that was made except through Him. Jesus is the origin of light. How did He come to the Apostle Paul? 
light shining as bright as the sun at noonday blinded the Apostle Paul. As he said, he, he said, Saul, Saul, and he said, who, who are you? And he says, I'm Jesus. It's Jesus' is light. The disciples saw him as light at the Mount of Transfiguration. He glowed so bright. Moses had the privilege of having a face-to-face, eye-to-eye relationship with him. And it caused him to glow so much he had to put a veil over his face. So we know enlightenment comes from Jesus. Look at this in John chapter 1, verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did and do receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. Word became flesh, and his dwelling was among us. He made it here with us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And it says in John chapter 12, verse 35, that Jesus told them, you are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. Believe in the light while you have the light, so that you may become children of light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. I want us to think about what this is saying. This is Jesus saying, there is a time and a season and an opportunity that we have to be enlightened. But it comes and it goes. Jesus said to them, while the light is with you, be enlightened. While the light is present, you allow that light to do what it has to do because darkness is coming. There are seasons that come and go. But when you have it, another verse says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. When his light shines into an environment, It is your task, it is your obligation, and it is up to you entirely to allow that light, to accept that light and allow Him to enlighten you. And this is really our prayer. We pray for enlightenment. And Ephesians chapter 1 verse 18, Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. So this is our prayer. It's my prayer for you. I'm praying that your heart may be enlightened. Why? So that you know the hope to which he has called you. He's calling you to his light. He's asking you to come into his light. He wants to enlighten you, but the question is, enlightened for what? What is the enlightenment do for you? What is it causing you to have light for what? Well, we're going to see four things about enlightenment, all coming from that verse that we just read in introduction in Hebrews chapter 6. Those elements, and there's some things that the Lord revealed to me as I studied it this past week, and more specifically, even today as I prepared this message. So these are four things. We begin with the first heavenly gift. Because it says that those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift. There is a gift that the Lord is giving us, a heavenly gift that He wants to provide for us. He speaks about this. Jesus spoke about it to the woman at the well in John chapter 4, verse 10. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, 
And who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So you know that he, he told in this verse, he tells the woman at the well of a coming dispensation of enlightenment when we all could have our eyes opened and therefore never thirst again. He references it to her actually within the parameters of worship, if you remember. Because worship is the moment in the time when enlightenment occurs. When we honor, when we seek the Lord, when we give Him glory and we worship, that is the most likely moment. It says that the Father is looking for those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth, the true worshipers. The true worshipers are the ones who are enlightened. And the true worshipers are the ones made eligible to taste the gift of the Lord. Notice the differentiation between the gift and the Lord. If you knew the gift and who it is that asked you for a drink. Because God himself is not the gift. Nor is technically the Holy Spirit the gift because Jesus and the Spirit were one. He tells the woman there's a time coming when you will receive the light. When the light shines on you, you will be able to be enlightened. He, in John chapter 7, says on the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit when those who believed in him were later to receive. But up to that time, the Spirit had not yet been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. The Spirit could not come until Jesus went because it was the dispensation of the Spirit. We had the dispensation of the physical Christ here on earth that he ascended and then the dispensation of the Spirit begun and we all could be made that in that, that partaker that we're going to talk about at the end. By the way, when I break down this verse to you, I'm going to put the Holy Spirit in the end simply because I noticed that three of the four things are all called something we taste, beginning with the gift. We taste the gift, but only the Holy Spirit. It says of the Spirit that we are partakers, and we're going to see exactly what that means at the end of this message. But Jesus in this verse invites everyone who is thirsty to drink of heaven's water, experience an enlightenment that will help us to walk deeper with God in spirit. And the simple question I have here is, have you tasted the gift? I would say that most have. You can taste the gift. The enlightenment, part of it, now I'm going to, actually if you consider the four things that we're covering, you'll see the necessary ingredients to true enlightenment. If you're missing one of these, one very key and important one, which we will see on the end, the Holy Spirit, then the enlightenment has not fully occurred. But the other three you can experience as kind of a sample platter to entice you, to tantalize you, to step over into a full enlightenment. But not everyone operates, not everyone goes there. Most taste the gift because the gift comes from people who are truly enlightened. They become the channel through which that gift can occur. The gift is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The gift is the presence of God. That is symbolic of that living water that flows. It's the flow of the Spirit. When I was there in Africa in the ministry of Apostle Grace, he absolutely is giving out the gift. He gives gifts out. He's very generous when it comes to spiritual gifts. They're there flowing and you feel them thrown off the stage. They're hitting you in the head. Spiritual gifts are just flowing in his ministry. It's a beautiful thing to be in a ministry where God is. And I understand it because in my ministry also I give gifts. 
A big part of my ministry is the reality, not only of the person of the Spirit, but the reality of the transference of spiritual gifts. But that is not the Holy Spirit. It is part, it is a product of the Holy Spirit with the Spirit being its source. And you can enjoy it as long as you come into my ministry. I promise I will continue to give spiritual gifts out. And Paul said it. He said, I long to be with you to the Romans so that I might impart, what? Some spiritual gift. So that we know anointed men of God, anointed women of God in you, if you are so anointed, have the ability to give spiritual gifts to people. People are confused sometimes about it. This word gift reappears several times in the scriptures, always relating to the flow or the manifestation of the power of God. Simon the sorcerer offered money for it. And it refers to what he saw as the gift. It was something he could see and place a demand on enough that he wanted to pay for it. He said, pray for me. And he offered money. And of course, you know that the apostle told him, may your money perish with you if you think the gift of the Holy Spirit can be purchased with money. And he ended up repenting and the apostle was able to minister to him. But that gift comes. I've tasted from many gifts. As a young man, before I really was enlightened, I, I tasted many gifts. And I loved them. I absolutely enjoyed them. But they were kind of like when you go to a supermarket and or you pass by a Bakua kiosk, they have those little samples on the end of a toothpick. It's a little bit, how many of you ever tasted that and thought, man, I wish I had more? That's exactly what it's like when you go to a ministry to receive the gifts of the spirit that are in operation. But in true enlightenment, there's more. And I'm going to share that with you at the end of this message. The second thing, the good word of God. It says in the verse, and have tasted the good word of God. Whenever you see the word good is an adjective in conjunction with the word in the Bible, it's emphatic and it's showing you that it's not just any word. Jesus was referred to as the good shepherd in context with many shepherds, some of which were hirelings. They were not the good shepherd, but the good shepherd was differentiated. The good word of God is something different. Luke chapter 24, verse 44, he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. So we know that Jesus is able to enlighten us so that our minds can comprehend the logos, thereby transforming it into rhema. Which, by the way, that verse that we just looked at where it says the good word, it's not the good logos, it's the good rhema. The logos is the physical manifestation of the word as in something written on a page. In fact, you know where it says in the beginning was the word, the word was, was with God, the word was God, that's logos. So Jesus was the logos. Why? Because Jesus could stand there without speaking a word. Jesus could come into this room and stand physically and not say anything. In fact, is one verse that says concerning the Syrophoenician woman that he answered her not a word. So he had the power to just be Logos. Just like you have a Bible and on this page, technically these white uh, illuminated letters are Logos. Because Rhema is the spoken word. And when we receive or taste the good word of God, according to that verse, it means the, the God-breathed word, the spoken word, the preached word, the prophesied word. Because that comes to you, through you, and for you via an enlightenment, an opening of your eyes. And Jesus can do this. Remember we said already Jesus is the source of this enlightenment. Then he opened their minds 
so they could understand the scriptures. The scriptures being the logos, but the understanding being the rainbow. Now, as I said concerning uh, the, the actual uh, gift of God, I asked you the question, have you tasted the good word of God? Now, the same thing applies to the good word of God that applied to gift. The good word of God will pour out of an enlightened ministry. It will pour out of an enlightened teacher, an enlightened pastor. You may receive the good word of God on your own, but it's less common than when you hear it shared. Now, if your primary source of good word is coming from an external place, that is another ministry or a pastor or an evangelist or a leader, for that season, that is good, but that is not a full enlightenment. Because a full enlightenment means that you taste and have, you have the one from which the good word is coming and you will always have it. I promise that I'm going to do my very best to dish up the good word of God here at Antioch. And I do my best. And not everyone enjoys the messages. Um, partly, my messages are why we are a small church. Because they are heavy. They are weighty. I am not a preacher who's preaching feel-good messages. There are lots of feel-good messages about how you're a head and not a tail. I could encourage you and tell you how wonderful you are, how beautiful you are, and you inspire joy, joy feelings and everyone you meet, and you're awesome, and you're beautiful. And that may make you feel good for a moment, but in the long run, it's not really going to help you grow spiritually. So there must be more. There has to be rhema. God's word. And those words sometimes. It says all God breathed words, that is all scripture, is profitable for doctrine. Now that doctrine is then qualified by saying for correction, reproof, and instruction in righteousness. So doctrine is one third, 33.3% correction. 33.3% reproof. And only 33.3% instruction in righteousness. If it is breathed of God, because that's what that verse says. God breathes. God inspired. The thing that comes, the rhema that comes, the good word of God, about two out of three times you hear it, it's going to be slapping you around. It's going to be spanking your little hiney and it's going to be sending you to bed without supper sometimes. And that's important that we have that. Because that's how we grow. That's how we learn. You know, as a young Christian, I was drawn to the mean preachers. There were, there were feel-good preachers. But I was drawn to the Rod Aguilard. That man was so scary. His bro he, has a, he has a really big brow. It's one of the biggest brows I've ever seen. He's descendant of indigenous American. He's tribal. And he looks like the old western pictures of the Indian. And all that's missing is the feather and the, and the bow. And, the, and he would come into the church. And he would, his messages were powerful. But they set me straight. Every time I heard something, I'd go, Ooh, I felt like I was getting stabbed. Ugh, ah. Oh, I would leave his meetings and my back would hurt. Like, ah. But I would grow by it. And I loved it. We had another minister that would come. His name was Ernie Fry. He would come from the North United States, a minister in our church. His messages were searing. You could smell like bacon, your flesh melting when that man preached. Powerful word of God. Other people, when they found out those people were coming, they stayed home. I went ready. Uh, you know, I was ready. I was like, here I am, beat me again. Spank away. Because I want, I longed to be all that I could be for God. And I still do. When I read and I look into the perfect law of liberty, I want to continue there and like it says. I don't want to be like the man that looks in the mirror and walks away forgetting what manner of man. I want his word to burn me. And it does. It goes 
deep. That's the good word of God. And you're thinking, well, it doesn't sound very good to me. Well, if you're enlightened, that's how his word will speak to you, to grow you, to develop you. And it's good. It's good because it bears fruit unto eternal life. Next, the powers of the world to come. I love the gift. I love the good word, but oh, the powers of the world to come. We can taste them. These powers of the world to come, dunamis is the Greek word. It is often translated works. It could be easily said the works of the world to come. We can taste of the functioning of the world to come. This word world is aeon, from where I said before the negative form is never and the positive form is ever. It's often translated ever. You say you mean the ever to come? It just means the eternal age. The age that has no end. Our age has an end. Jesus said, Lo, I will be with you even to the end of your age. Because that will end. But his age, the age to come, the world that is coming has no end to it. But in it, there are treasures. In it, there is power. And via an enlightenment, you can taste those powers. Once you've tasted the powers of that world, nothing else satisfies you. Catherine Kuhlman used to say, oh, once you've found the power, you've found heaven's treasure. And it's like the treasure hid in the field. You want to keep it. You will sell everything to buy that field. Not because of the field. To me, the field is the ministry. I give up my life to serve him in ministry. Because in that capacity, the treasure is buried there. The ministry is not my treasure, by the way. I often hate the ministry. I often despise the ministry. I have spat at the ministry. And the ministry will kill you if you Rodney Hyde Brown used to say all the time, if you let the ministry really affect you, if you really take it too seriously, so you will find yourself in a rubber room with a straitjacket on saying, <laughs> the ministry, the ministry, the ministry, running into the walls. And if you've had any time in ministry, you know what I'm talking about. But oh, the powers. Ha! Ha! Phew! Mm. Mm. The treasure hid in the field is worth it. I don't care how hard it might be sometimes. It's worth it because we have the power of the world to come. We get to taste and experience little pieces of what God has. What is waiting for us? I think you've heard me share that story before when I said, God, we just want a little bit of the power of the world to come. And, and a whole bunch of us were totally slain in the Spirit. We ended up on the floor under the power of God, unconscious, they had to go get my wife to come and kneel beside me to say goodbye because they thought I was dead. My wife literally was drug out of her home. Your husband's dying. Come say goodbye. Literally, she came. And she held my hand and she said, if you have to go, you have to go. Yeah, you know my wife. That's Bob. That's Bob. You gotta go, go, right? Whatever. Just do what you gotta do. And I, and I just, I so caught up in the Spirit. And that's just because I asked for a little bit of the powers of the world to come. Just a little bit from that world makes a big difference in this world. Jesus said, if you have faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, faith, pistis, that word is not earthly, it's eternal. And to every one of us a measure is given. But if you can just tap into a little bit of that power, that dynamite, is what the Greek word dunamis is where we get the word dynamite. That explosive material that is more volatile than nitroglycerin or plastic explosive C4 can't do anything next to the smallest portion of the powers of the world to come. You see, where do we get that? You get that from the Enlightenment. You get that for now. You may enjoy the gift. You may enjoy the good word of God. You may enjoy the powers of the world to come. But often we find that believers do not experience that power except in the church or in a ministry. 
where the anointing is flowing. People have often said to me, well, we want you to come do this conference because you have the anointing. And I always think, and what do you have? Chicken soup? Shouldn't you also have the anointing? Because I believe all people are eligible to be enlightened and have the anointing. But there's a season that you receive from another one's ministry, but I will never do you the disservice of making you believe that you are not 100% eligible for a complete enlightenment and that you need not that any man teach you because you have an unction from the Holy One, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But once again, as we approach... The, the last thing we're going to see in a moment. Let's finish up powers. Acts 1.8 says you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Now notice it does not say that you will receive power and that's the Holy Spirit. Once again, there's a separation. The Holy Spirit is not the power. And this is where a lot of believers miss it. They believe that the power and the presence is the person. And it's not. To develop a relationship with God. See, because the verse here says that we taste the powers of the coming age, the eternal dimension, or our future home. But then this verse says that we receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. The Spirit comes, and what did Jesus say? And while the light is with you, receive. When the Spirit comes into an environment, into a room, He's handing things out. He's handing the gift. He's handing the good Word of God. He's handing the powers of the world to come. And you get to taste it all. But there's more. There's a greater realm. There's another level for you. And if you tap into it, if you truly seek until that enlightenment is yours, then your destiny will be carved in eternity. And everything will play out for you. God will do amazing things for you. And I'm telling you, always seek. Have you tasted the powers of the world to come? Now, Fourth and final, the Holy Ghost. It says there, and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. Now right away I point out that uh, the enlightenment that Jesus gives us comes through the Holy Spirit. You receive power, but the enlightenment also, the Holy Spirit is not the enlightenment. The best way that I can describe the enlightenment, that is when your lights are turned on, is your awareness and therefore appreciation and utilization of the relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit. Because most people, this is, you are enlightened when you come into a reality of the person of the Spirit because you're no longer subject to another man's ministry and feeding off the sample platters of everyone else, but now you have what you need. It's like this, and, and I always tell the Holy Spirit when I use this analogy, don't be offended, I'm just trying to illustrate. Why do you want to buy the milk when you can have the cow? And your milk is with you at all times. You can get milk anytime you want, just squirt, 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 squirt. Because the cow is right there with you. If you are made a partaker of the Holy Spirit, you will never thirst again. You will never long for a gift. You will have more gifts than you know what to do with. Because you have the gift factory standing at your side. You won't be searching for the good Word of God by going from seminar to seminar and seeking in this pastor and Brother Doodad and Prophet Knickknack and all have to go to this conference and got the t-shirt and the bumper sticker. and You won't need that because the good Word of God will rain on you every morning because the person of the Holy Spirit will personally teach you. That's what you need. Partaker. John 14, 16 and 17 says, And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept Him because it neither sees Him nor knows Him, but you know Him, for He lives with you and will be in you. Now Jesus is referring to Himself with His disciples. You know Him. We wouldn't be surprised when he said it. Of course, we can't see it, that he may have motioned to himself. Well, you know him, but he will be in you. Meaning, my dispensation is a knowledge of me, but that dispensation of the Spirit, in which you can have the enlightenment, the Spirit will be inside of you. 
And you will always have the person of the Spirit at your side. In fact, where it says participant, this is the Greek word, metochos is the Greek word. Participant as a noun, a sharer by implication, an associate, a fellow, partaker, partner. Similar to the word parakletos. We know that word parakletos, right? The one called alongside to help. This is a sister word to that, which means someone to be at your side. He works with us, confirming the word that we preach with signs and wonders. Luke 5, 7, So they signaled their partners, same Greek word, metochos, they signaled their metochos in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. In other words, they were work companions. And this is what the verse is saying. You will be made a work companion with the Holy Ghost, which means you stand side by side, and He is with you, and you are with Him, and He holds you, He guides you, He leads you personally. You don't need to seek the gift. He has all the gifts you need right there at your side. That means next to you, and inside of you is the temple. The river of living water will flow, and the Holy Spirit will walk with you every step of the way. Each of the other elements of this verse are spoken of, of something you can taste and experience, but only the Holy Spirit in this verse is a partner, you being a partaker with Him. The other elements that we receive by enlightenment are things we receive from the source that is the Spirit. So if you develop a relationship with the gift, the Word, and the power, you will always have to return to the ministry of someone else to be able to continue to receive those things. If you're made partaker of the Holy Spirit, you have an understanding and appreciation of the source of the gift, the Word, and the power. And it's with you wherever you go. That's why I'm always pressing people to seek, to press in, to find that relationship with God. Have you been made partaker of the Holy Ghost? Good question. Now, as, as I got saved... I read about people who had been enlightened. I read about people who had these experiences. I realized I didn't have it. And I decided I needed to seek it. And I saw it year after year after year. It took 10 years before I, I honestly began to experience that. Not 10 years uh, working in a shoe store. 10 years in full-time ministry. 10 years preaching, teaching, operating on the field, putting my life on the line, risking myself for years, being threatened, paying a price, sickness and disease because of the adverse conditions I lived in, typhoid, hepatitis, dengue 17 times, a lot of prices I've paid through the years before I ever got to that point. He finally came down and said, it's time for an enlightenment. And if you're serious, he will give you that. Summation of it all, we see. Those who are enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift, have you tasted the gift? And were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Have you been made partaker of the Holy Ghost? And have tasted the good word of God. Have you tasted the good word? And the powers of the world to come. Have you tasted the power of that world? Do you experience that power? It's yours for the taking. I don't mind as long as you're in this ministry. In the season and the time, the light is here. But you know what? Things evolve. Things change. People come and go. People get reassigned in their work assignments. God sends people out. While you do have the opportunity to learn from someone that has been enlightened, you study and study hard. I've spent time under men of God women of God that have been enlightened and I asked a million questions. Pick their brains. I wanted to know. Wanted to know. Wanted to learn. I had some wonderful times in Africa this past week just sitting and talking specifically with some of the individual Africans. A dear brother, a keyboard player, a drummer, a bass player could do anything and I had some just some moments where I was able to sit and talk to him such a sweet man. Didn't have a lot. He had very little. The Spirit of the Lord touched him so deeply. He wanted to give me something. 
And all he had was his headphones to his, to his phone and with which he could listen to worship and enjoy. And he loved those headphones, and it's all he had. And he took those headphones, and he wrapped them up in his hand. And he came in front of me, and he says, I want you to pray for me. And he got on his knees, and he put those headphones in my hand. And my first impulse is, no, no, I have headphones. I have Three hundred dollar pair of headphones in my bag. I, oh, don't! And I immediately, but the Lord says, "Don't taint the gift. Accept it." So hard. You say, "What are you going to do with those headphones? I'm going to cycle them back into someone who doesn't have headphones." Not you, by the way. I'm going to go to Cambodia. I'm going to go to some place where people are poor. It's really going to bless them. And He asked, and I prayed for Him. Sweet, sweet. There's times that I watched. His, his lights turn on when I was talking to him. Uh, talked about worship. Talked, they are very talented at playing. But there are things, when you are enlightened, you can do things with a keyboard that people that have not yet been enlightened, no matter what their skill level is, they can't achieve it. All the reasons why we all need to vehemently, continuously seek that relationship with him. Amen? You say, well, now you're going to pray for us to be enlightened? No, not really. Because once again, it's it's a seeking. You look for, of course, I'm going to pray for you, but I, I, I don't have the light switch. It says those who have been made partakers. Hmm. You cannot make yourself a partaker. Salvation doesn't come by what you do. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but the Father in heaven, it says. Same with the relationship with the Spirit. That enlightenment is something that the Father decides for you. Just seek the Father. Beg, that's what I did. For years, beg the Father, give me the Holy Spirit. Give me a relationship with God. For years, I just cried out for the power. For years, I just cried out for the gift. I never even knew that you could have a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit like a human. I thought gift, great. Power, great. Word, great. Give me the word. And that was my whole focus. And a lot of people, that's their focus. And sometimes evangelists and pastors and teachers seem to hide the secret of their relationship with the Holy Spirit. Not me. I'm going to shout it from the housetop. I don't believe in elitism of ministry.